Health Live at Seniors Today. February 14th every year is celebrated as Valentine's Day, where matters of heart are of major concern. And uh, perhaps coincidentally, we here today on Seniors Today and our weekly Health Live series have a session on heart. And uh, we've invited Dr. Kaushal Chatrapati to speak on preventive cardiology and medication management. Uh, before I welcome Dr. Chatrapati, a little about him. He's a senior interventional cardiologist based in Mumbai. He is uh, done his MBBS as well as his MD from Mumbai and uh, then the DM in cardiology from the Bombay Hospital in uh, and, and the University of Mumbai. He has International Society Fellowships of the American College of Cardiology, the Society of Coronary Angiography and Intervention and the Fellowship of European Society of Cardiology. He's done postdoctoral course fellowships and courses in uh, uh, which are like uh, in advanced intervention cardiology from uh, a New York hospital and training in advanced heart failure therapies and transplantation from Ohio State University. University. He has uh, he, he he practices in various hospitals in Mumbai, and we are delighted to have you here uh, today, Dr. Chatrapati. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much, and thank you for your kind words and praise. Thank you, Dr. Chatrapati. Before I uh, start uh, asking you questions, because the format that we are following since the topic of the uh, of the session today is preventive cardiology and medication management and it's a little basic uh, uh, dr satyapati will not be making a presentation as we normally have and um, we will be asking him questions and to which he will respond but uh, and 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 those of you who have questions after that uh, you can as always put them put them in the q and a tab and um, we will uh, put it to doctor doctor my question to you first question to you is are are cases of the heart increasing obviously we do know but in your uh, uh, you know, long years of practice. Uh, what would you say is the is the number of patients who have increased over the years? Yes, of... definitely. Yes, definitely. The number of cases of heart are increasing. Number of these heart diseases are increasing over the years. Not only because uh, we have been a little more uh, casual in our attitude uh, towards the issues of the heart. We don't exercise enough and we eat junk food. But also because with increasing lifespan, the elderly population is increasing, and elderly population has certain problems of its own and those cases are also increasing uh, but yes uh, in a nutshell if I were to give a simple yes or no answer definitely the question uh, the heart cases are increasing all over the world all over the world I agree with you heart cases are increasing my, my first question to you and since we are talking about uh, preventive medicine and uh, preventive cardiology what are the what according to you are the key principles of uh, preventive cardiology and um, that, that one must have, you know, in, in very broad terms of preventive cardiology uh, that one must uh, um, practice and uh, observe. Yeah, so basically, uh, we have been just given one body and we have to take care of it all of our life. So basically, we should respect our body and take good care of our body. Now, all of us have cars, right? And every year we take our car for a service. Every six months, every year, we take our car for a service. But how many of us go for a regular health checkup every six months? That's a question we should be asking ourselves. Uh, we should be cognizant of what we are eating. Fast food is very good, but of course, it's like empty calories does not have any nutrition. And in fact, a lot of uh, fast food has uh, deleterious substances, high high uh, amount of salt, uh, trans fats, which are all bad for our heart and uh, cause heart attacks, you know. So we should think about eating samosas and kachoris and uh, vada pounds and pizzas and pastas and whatnot. So these are uh, about the diet. Also, uh, a lot of people today are not uh, very uh, uh, cognizant about the fact that they have to exercise daily. Yeah, So we should at least have 35 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every day, uh, which has to be uh, embroidered in our schedules. You know, we can't just, uh, uh, you know, go around living a life, you know, just walking uh, a short distances from car to the uh, lift, you know. And that's what most of us do. So I think we have to somehow incorporate exercise in our everyday life. And if you really can't make time for it, find innovative ways to do it. For example, if you want to go to somebody's house or your office, for example, park a couple of bus stops away from your uh, hospital and walk the distance. Don't take lift, take stairs. Right. Whatever it is, get in the mandatory steps in, you know. Right. For all all individuals, I would say six right. to eight thousand steps is a very achievable goal for all all ages, and which you have to do it like in a day, if not ten thousand steps. Yeah, doctor, you know you gave a very interesting analogy of a car mechanic and a car. Yeah. And, um, so as just as you said that there is a preventive uh, uh, checkup that one does of the car uh, every year. You also need to 
oil it well enough, uh, you know, periodically. And uh, what are these uh, oiling uh, uh, requirements that one needs to do other than, yeah. of course, just, uh, you know, assuming, for instance, if a person is all well uh, and, and doesn't really have any major complaints and who's 60, what does a person do to ensure that she or he is well oiled? So 60 is uh, a little too late, sir. I mean... I would I would say that 30 is the age where you need to preemptively start checking your uh, uh, health data, you know, and numbers, because uh, uh, 60 is when uh, you know diseases are already set in, you know. So uh, a lot of people think that they are symptomatic and therefore they did not do anything. But say, for example, diseases like hypertension and diabetes, they do not have symptoms unless they are far progressed and have already caused complications, right? So we don't want to intervene that late in that their natural history because otherwise we'll be left with some scars of the disease, right? So we need to intervene in the primordial phase when the disease has not yet begun or is just about to set in, you know. So therefore, everybody uh, after the 30 should get their blood pressure measured routinely, okay? And then their HbA1c, that is the three-month average of blood sugar measured, and the fasting lipid profile, cholesterol uh, measured uh, at least once a year. I mean, I do it on my birthday every year, so that I don't forget, right? Um, so uh, that is something... Uh, which you need to know. And if you are incidentally detected diabetes, uh, diabetic, for example, you can treat uh, you can treat yourself early in the natural history of the disease, lose weight, exercise, do all the right things, and maybe you'll be off the diabetic medications uh, and you won't be having diabetes for long. That's that's uh, that's a positive part about it. Similarly, for blood pressure, you can start medicines early, you can lose some weight, you can uh, uh, regularly exercise, and blood pressure medicines will be decreased. The same, same goes for cholesterol medications. So rather than wait for problems to arise, which is the normal human trait, unfortunately, the right thing to do is, uh, you know, preemptively seek out your numbers. What is your blood pressure? What is your HbA1c level? What is your LDL cholesterol value? And uh, if I randomly ask you these three questions, you should be in a position to confidently answer this question. Right? My HbA1c is 5.6 or my LDL cholesterol is 100. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Right. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, th I think the points that you made are, are good. Since we are talking about, you, you mentioned about exercise. Uh, what exercises do you think uh, these senior citizens should be performing every day? You mentioned yeah. about parking your car a little far than the normal place so that you can walk. Uh, you know, using uh, the steps to uh, uh, to walk down rather than use a lift. But what are the what are the you know three or five exercises that one must do or types of exercise that one must do to to keep oneself fit? So yes, sir. So after fifty, after the age of fifty, Mr. Pradyuman, uh, there is a uh, like. Uh, uh, sarcopenia which ensues sarcopenia in common terms is loss of muscle okay so uh that is a natural history with the changing hormones falling testosterone levels uh the body tends to lose muscle and become weak in order to counter that we have to exercise especially after 50 we have to have a high protein diet and exercise now uh, exercises can be in various forms. If you really ask me, what does the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology recommends? They recommend a healthy mix of um, aerobic and anaerobic exercises. That is some amount of weight training and some amount of aerobic exercises. Now, aerobic exercises is something which can be easily adopted, you know, by everybody. Uh, but uh, nowadays, a lot of I see in my gym where I go on a daily basis, there are a lot of 60, 70 year old people who are systematically indulging in weight training. And that is something which didn't I didn't see a few years back. Right. So uh, that is something which you should do, uh, of course, with a proper cardiac clearance, knowing that you don't have any untreated blood pressure or any incipient coronary artery disease or something like that, which will surprise you. But at the same time, uh, uh, walking is, I think, one of the most uh, underrated exercises you know um i mean uh 10, steps may be good for a healthy adult even for a septuagenarian or octogenarian it's not difficult to walk 6,000 steps to 8,000 steps if you have been healthy and been wa uh, walking since a long time you know and that is something i would highly encourage you know maybe climb a few stairs if you can so the thing is if you preserve your muscle strength if you preserve your leg muscles if you preserve your hip muscles then you won't fall and uh a fall is the worst thing which can happen to a 70-year-old guy or an 80-year-old guy because then they have weak bones to begin with, especially the women in India, uh, and they will develop a fracture neck femur and that will be the cause of their demise because then it causes a multitude of problems, bed sores and 
pneumonia and what not so i think it's very important to be mobile and for being mobile you have to combat sarcopenia that is muscle loss and for that you have to exercise regularly ideally a combination of uh, resistance exercises that is weights and uh, uh, cardio exercises that is walking on a treadmill or even taking brisk walks but the most if, if you can't do anything else just walk yeah and target 6 to 8 thousand steps every day which i'm sure very few people at the age of 60 70 are doing today right thank you uh, absolutely Six to seven thousand steps a day is uh, uh, the message from Dr. Chattopati. Uh, doctor, what about uh, uh, stuff like yoga and meditation? Now, these are uh, and and how helpful do you think are these? Yoga, I, I you know I can understand is an extension of exercises, but meditation in terms of just keeping oneself uh, one one's balance right and peace of mind. Very very interesting question. Now, yoga is a stretching exercise, so uh, uh, don't consider yoga as a form of aerobic exercise. You cannot uh, substitute it for walking for example right it's a stretching exercise which keeps your joints nimble which keeps your joints well lubricated and which keeps you from getting arthritis from maintaining flexibility and this and, and maintaining balance and these will help you walk better so basically doing yoga will ensure that you walk better and right. if you walk better that contributes to your aerobic lineup and yoga is not to be un uh, underrated at all it's a fantastic exercise it's a fantastic body uh, so you have to have some amount of stretching exercises and yoga does that beautifully okay as far as meditation is concerned it is underrated uh, and uh, a lot of people dismiss meditation as something which we don't need in fact it's something which you really need to combat stress yeah so meditation basically calms the mind decreases the sympathetic drive and uh, relaxes the body relaxes the blood vessels so that the blood pressure is lowered and cardiac events decrease right now there is an objective way of measuring it like if you do a meditation for say even a couple of minutes every day and you see your HRV or heart rate variability that increases significantly and this is one of the markers of longevity okay uh, patients who have low heart rate variability or HRV which is seen in many of the smart watches nowadays which we have that is increased by meditation that is increased by maintaining calm you know uh, and uh, stress is a very important cause of uh, cardiac mortality today believe it or not and I think uh, it has to be a multi-pronged approach you know uh, you can't do only cardio or only resistance training or only yoga or only meditation. It's a healthy mix of all of these, which will give you holistic health benefits. Right, Dr. Weil, you know, exercise and yoga are things that are easier done. Uh, and of course, one has to find the time. But meditation is something that a lot of people have said is, is perhaps the toughest thing to do because just to sit idle and you know, uh, concentrate on uh, on on being that is, is is very tough, especially for people who are working or who have stresses, etc. Just just to kind of ask you this question: How do you manage? You know, you have a stressful life uh, and, and long. Uh, uh, you know, uh, long days. How do you manage to keep yourself uh, uh, with your meditation and exercise, etc.? No, no. So, so uh, um, exercise is something which I do in the morning every day. But meditation is something you can do anytime, right? You can do it anytime. And in fact, meditation is, I would say, the easiest of all. I mean, I won't say that you need to do one hour meditation every day. You can just start with a couple of minutes. That's all you need. Yeah. You just need a couple of minutes and from that increase to five minutes, 10 minutes. I think even if you do 10 minutes of meditation every single day and maintain that, it does a huge difference in your mental well-being, your spiritual well-being, and but also your physical health. Okay. So, uh, uh, I mean, first day you won't be able to do 10 uh, minutes of uh, meditation for sure. So what is needed is you just have to close your eyes. It should be a comfortable room preferably air conditioned with a nice like proper temperature no light it should be dark and you can just uh, set a timer on your watch or your uh, phone or whatever uh, and for two minutes and then for those two minutes actively discourage any thoughts from coming into your mind now that won't happen right you will always think of something but the fact that you are trying to not think of anything is enough and it will increase as you practice it more and more regularly and do it for two minutes every day, you will feel a sense of calm and do it up repeatedly again and again and you can increase it to five to ten minutes. Or uh, if you have say an Apple watch or something like that, you can do meditation and check your heart rate variability after meditation. It will increase immediately. And if you do it regularly, you will have incremental benefits. And these are the, and I, that's why our, you know, our old sadhus who lived in the grand old days, they lived for a long time because they used to meditate for hours together which is something you and I cannot do. But whatever little we can do, like say even 10 minutes per day, 
is more than enough for us. Right. Ten minutes of meditation. I agree. And I think you you start with two minutes and then then graduate to ten. Beauty. And as long as you're comfortable, you don't need to necessarily be in uh in robes and and all of that. You could be wearing no your... no no no. Regular clothes and uh, just be at at peace with yourself. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, suggestion and and very interesting way of starting it, uh, Doctor. A question for you is that, you know, these days, uh, there's a lot of information available on medical issues. You have, uh, you can just Google your way to, to get all the information. And there's uh, the good old Dr. Google who's there available 24 by 7. How much would you think is that a, a cause for uh, uh, a fair amount of mismanagement of uh, patient health? So I will tell you this very frankly. So I'm a cardiologist, so uh, a lot of my speciality and my knowledge lies just around the cardiology field because I've been doing it for last uh, last few decades, right? So uh, if anybody in my immediate family or friend circle gets a problem other than cardiology, I desist myself from Googling and I refer them to the regular, to the required specialist. I mean... Uh, arguably, I'm in a much better position to kind of filter out what is important and not from Google rather than a common man. But I desist myself from the temptation because internet is such a uh, democratic resource, if I may say so, that it will present all kinds of uh, treatment protocols, some which some of which are sheer quackery to something which is state of the art, right? Now. You don't know what is really right because uh, number of options is not important. What is required for you is important. And that only a person who is uh, in the business of treating these patients on a day-to-day -day basis can understand. So if I do not uh, Google, and I strictly do not Google for any of my relatives, friends, or even myself, if the topic is not a cardiac topic, I don't Google any other specialty. Then uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, I think that answers your question. Right, absolutely. I think, uh, and but, but you know, in your experience, do you see that as, as a big problem in terms of patient, in patients uh, being disinformed or, you know, um, at times when they come to you for consultations, they ask you questions which are um, inspired by the knowledge that they have gained? Yeah, so I try to answer them in a scientific manner. Uh, you know, not belittling them or not blaming them for Googling, but, you know, putting, in pers putting things in perspective, you know. Like, for example, a human, uh, 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 just a patient came to me just before our conversation started. And he had changes of, uh, he had some chest pain since last one week. And he had some changes in the ECG. And uh, I thought he would need an angiogram. And he asked me, but I've read on internet that a lot of cardiac diseases can be treated without um, angiography or angioplasty these days, you know. So is that an option for me? So, well, this is true, but it has to be put in perspective. So uh, there is a choice that you can treat cardiac disease just on medicines without doing angiography, angioplasty. But this is especially true if the disease is chronic. Right. If the patient is suffering it for more than six months, one year, you know, for acute diseases where the duration is less, like say a week and the symptoms are increasing, the best option is doing angiography and if required doing angioplasty, right? So uh, I put it in perspective. So Google tells you that you can do this and you can do that, but which subset to do what is something which you can only distill from years of experience and medical knowledge. I hope uh, this example yeah, kind yeah. of clarifies. Yeah, in fact, since you mentioned about chest pain, you know, uh, what are the, what are the, you know, three things one should do when one experiences chest pain? And first of all, you know, how do you know that this is chest pain and this is not some, you know, a muscular uh, uh, spasm or whatever? Yeah, so uh, especially when, because this channel is geared towards elderly, yeah, um, I would say you don't know which chest pain is muscular and which chest pain is acidity and which chest pain is heart attack. The simple answer is you don't know. That's the easiest way to put it, you know. So every chest pain above a certain age, at least above 50, 60 years of age, 
merits an ECG. Okay. And you need to go to a tertiary care hospital near you. And you should get an ECG at that hospital. Okay. Um, once the ECG is abnormal, if it shows a heart attack, then you should call the cardiologist and he will decide the further course of action. Interventional cardiologist who will decide the further course of action. In most cases, if it's acute heart attack, you need an angioplasty stat, okay, which is known as primary angioplasty in myocardial infarction, PAMI, uh, which has saved many, many lives and there is no doubt about it. That is the only treatment which has, uh, you know, uh, scientific evidence in 2024. But other than that, if the ECG is showing some borderline changes, you need to do some enzymes like troponins, uh, troponin I, and uh, uh, then it's like a, a depends on the cardiologist what he suggests. He may suggest you an angiogram, or he may ask you to uh, go back and come after some days. And there's a risk stratification triage, which uh, is like you know it's on a patient to patient basis. Yeah. Doctor, these days a lot of smart watches and devices also are, are, are available yeah. to check the heart health. Um, how much would you think that these, this, you know, you, you mentioned about the tertiary uh, uh, center for medication. Is this perhaps the fourth frontier? Yeah. So um, smart watches are fantastic as long as you know how to use them. Okay. So, um, there's a condition known as atrial fibrillation where the heart beats very fast uh, at the rate of 120, 140, 200 beats per minute. And uh, that occurs in elderly individuals, in individuals with thyroid problems, in individuals who have certain valvular heart diseases, right? So uh, sometimes this atrial fibrillation comes and goes, right? So it's very difficult to uh, identify. But these smartwatches, when you're wearing them every day, they have a very high incidence of detecting atrial fibrillation. And that is what uh, this Apple Watch claims that it has mastery over. However, it cannot and does not even claim to diagnose heart attack. Okay? So there's a very limited uh, uh, usefulness of uh, these smartwatches as of today, tomorrow it may be possible, I don't know, to detect heart diseases per se. But for uh, guiding your fitness journey, I think these have a very big role, right? Uh, it can prompt you to get up, walk, stand, you know, then track your workouts, keep a record of your workouts and inspire you, make you compete with others who are having similar smartwatch to con to kind of create an online community of uh, people who are, uh, you know, interested in uh, health, uh, which motivates you. So you have various metrics like VO2 max and heart rate variability and all these things which you get on your uh, uh, smartwatch, which can help you improve your cardiovascular fitness. So in that way, they are very good. But if you want to just limit yourself to diagnosing heart attacks, these do a poor job as of now. Right. I, I think you've been as direct as as, as one should be. Uh, doctor, one more question before we look at uh, uh, questions that have been posed by people. As what are the common uh, cardiac concerns that uh, the elderly have and what should they be uh, yeah. looking at? You, you, one of course is chest pain, <laughs> but what else is, is, is a common concern? So uh, coronary artery disease remains the number one killer uh, with of cardiac diseases in India today. And uh, as age increases, definitely the incidence of coronary artery disease increases exponentially. Uh, the angioplasty, which is done in, in young people, is very different from angioplasty done in somebody who is like 75, 80 years old. Because the arteries are more hard hardened, they're more full of calcium. And they may require certain expert uh, uh, management and certain special devices like rotablation, intravascular lithotripsy. And uh, they benefit from intravascular uh, imaging more than others. And uh, they may have certain special concerns. Uh, so, they, the, so the management of atherosclerotic coronary artery disease is more 
the complications are more in elderly unless you use these devices right so that's one uh, second is as age progresses there is a tendency that the natural pacemaker of the heart keeps on failing you know so with 75 80 years we get the normal pacemaker of the heart failing and we need to put a artificial pacemaker that's also a function of age a lot of people who develop giddiness or uh, 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 syncope which is a fall um, is because of the failing pacemaker and if so they need to be evaluated and uh, a, per a permanent pacemaker needs to be implanted number two and of course the other 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 big concern is with increase in longevity and people living well into their 80s and 90s the aortic wall starts becoming hard and full of calcium uh, it's like becomes like a rock and so therefore aortic wall replacement is needed in these individuals with increasing frequency and nowadays uh, we have uh, mastered the technique of putting a aortic wall just with a small uh, incision a small a, a prick in the groin you know just like how angioplasty used to be done we can now replace valves in the heart in elderly with a groin through a groin and that is very important in elderly because most of the elderly are frail and cannot survive a open heart surgery for wall replacement. And this is like, uh, which open heart surgery is a lot of morbidity and mortality, 5% mortality in many cases, and sometimes even 20, 25, 30% mortality. But this is like a much safer procedure, which can be done. And the patient is sent home literally the next day. So, yeah. Right. Doctor, we have quite a few questions uh, that have come in. Yeah. Um, one which is uh, exercise related. Uh, this is from Veena Bayani, who is uh, 74. She says, if I have to climb three stories just after lunch and I feel hard after two stories, is it okay? What measure should I take? So, so I think you need to go to your cardiologist and get yourself checked because postprandial angina is something which is very common. You know, uh, So what happens is when you have a heavy meal, all the blood flow is directed towards your gut to digest the food. And therefore, heart gets less blood. And when you exert under those circumstances, uh, the heart gets even less blood. And so you sometimes develop chest tightness or angina. And that is uh, generally uh, a very common uh, way angina presents. So I think you should check up with your doctor. It may not be that, but always better to be safe than sorry. Absolutely. Uh, doctor, we have a question from Mr. Brijendra Kumar, who is 79. Uh, mm -hmm. He had angioplasty in 2012 and uh, in LAD and stent uh, uh, done in 2016. He's been fine since 2016. His question is, what is the life of uh, stent in stent? He is on regular medication. Yeah. So that's a very uh, important question and uh, something which cannot be uh, there's no one answer to it. It depends on many factors. First of all, uh, there is a failure rate of uh, stent which varies anywhere from 2 to 5%. Okay. And uh, this can be significantly improved if you take the right medications, for example, dual antiplatelet drugs, cholesterol lowering drugs, blood pressure and diabetes control, and you walk 35 minutes of brisk walk every day. Uh, you know, uh, some kind of exercise. If you do all of that, keep your weight in control, then the chances become very less. With the fourth generation drug eluting stents, which we have in the market today, this uh, 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 instant restenosis is still a problem. It's a finite problem. You can never say anything is zero, but it's become more and less and less significant over the years. The newer generation of stents have made it better and better. There is never a 0% chance. But as long as these parameters are met, I mean, God willing, you should be fine. All the best from my side. Thank you, doctor. We have a question from Mr. Bridge Dugal, who's 80. He says that he has put a pacemaker. He had an angioplasty 12 years back and he's diabetic. What should be his exercise routine and diet? I know it's a very large question, but just a quick one or two tips. So I think your exercise routine should be as... Uh, uh, normal as any exercise routine of any uh, other 80 year old or, or, or any other uh, 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 elderly gentleman as long as your pumping is normal yeah something which determines the exercise toleration tolerance is 
your pumping and uh, you have a pacemaker in place so that will take care of everything and you have a stent in place so uh, uh you are not permanently uh disabled once you have an angioplasty or a pacemaker i mean the very fact that you're going for these procedures is you want to live a normal life right so yeah right we have a question from Mr. kamlesh bajpai who is 70 50 50 kgs uh, HbA1c is 6.5. He has high BP. Three months back, he had done his angiography. No clots done. His sodium was low. Medicines have changed. Uh, all my 40 and one beta blocker in the evening. BP is controlled around 140 to 145. Often he feels a sensation in the head, a tightness as if it is gripped. And he feels difficulty in walking. In the morning, often it's okay. I walk for minimum 30 to 40 minutes daily, morning and evening. Head scan showed no signs. Neurosurgery. Surgeon said no such problem. And he wrote some vitamins and minerals. He hasn't asked a question, but I guess he's just seeking some advice as to what he should do. So I think, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Pratyaman, see, it's very difficult to answer uh, individual problems on this forum, you know, because, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, such such kind of advice can only be given after examining a patient. And, yeah, yeah. 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 and in fact, I, that's, that's the common message that we give to everybody. In fact, there are a few questions which are uh, I mean, generic questions or questions which are uh, questions on facts. It's some. It's okay, but not uh, not specific issues. Yeah, right. Uh, we have a question from Katie Dadanchi, who's um, uh, uh, who's also in her seventies. Uh, her, her question is, Doctor, how can I increase my B twelve level? Uh, she takes a neurobean fort once a day. What foods increase uh, B twelve level? She prefers to eat so, only chicken and fish, and no milk, egg. eggs. Are the uh, milk, eggs, curds, um, and um, uh, all non veg food, especially liver, all of them are rich in vitamin B12. Right. Uh, we have a question from Shobha Srivastav. She's 72. Sometimes she feels breathless. Is it a symptom of heart issues, heart problems? Could be. Could be. I mean, you need to you need to undergo a comprehensive evaluation before I could answer that question. But yes, a lot of times heart heart uh, problems present just with breathlessness and there is no chest pain, and that is what something which we call as angina equivalent. Right. Uh, we have a question from Shamla Ravi who says my husband is diabetic and hypertensive, both under control due to medication. Uh, no control on sugar and salt intake. Is it okay to take <laughs> sugar and salt even under medication? Sorry? Is it okay to take sugar and salt even under medication? I think she knows the answer of that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we have a question from Marjorie of Fernandez. Uh, her question is, can the mitral valve be replaced without open heart surgery? Yeah. Um, so, there is a procedure known as TMVR, TMVR, transmitral valve, uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement, which is in infancy right now. Uh, right now, it's only being done in patients who have had a previous mitral valve surgery and a valve in place, or in certain patients uh, whose mitral annulus has a lot of calcium, very low, small subset. The uh, in the process is in infancy right now. Uh, not the most common uh, treatment for a mitral valve disease. But if it was a yes and no question, yes, it can be done in a minority of patients. Right. Uh, doctor, we've got a few questions, which I know uh, uh, I'm trying to avoid the very specific ones. Uh, yeah. Rajiv Kumar uh, asks, what is the relevance of left axis deviation of the heart? He's 66, <laughs> takes statins, Lip control of medications. So, I mean, uh, left axis deviation is a ECG diagnosis, which can occur because of hundreds of reasons. I don't think you should go into the minutiae of that and you should leave that to your cardiologist because there are literally hundreds of reasons why you can get left axis deviation. Some of them can be significant. Some of them can be completely bunkum. So, yeah. So, I think... Uh, 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 the only way to learn how to read an ECG is to do five and a half years of medical school and then three years of MD and then three years of DM. That's when you learn to read ECG. I mean, if I could teach it uh, to you over a question-answer session on webinar, I mean, that would not be 
um, I mean, it would be little the very science, you know. Yeah. Right. Absolutely, Doctor. And thank you for uh, all your answers. Doctor, one last question that I have is, uh, and I'm sure you have experienced this, just as you have people going in for exercises and meditation, etc. There are also a fair number of alternative uh, uh, therapies which are available, which is acupressure, acupuncture, you know, uh, uh, and things of the like. And, and plus, of course, other uh, uh, forms of medication that are available. How much, I, and I know that, you know, you are an allopathic doctor, so you don't have any answers to that. But uh, how much should one be relying on that uh, as against, you know, coming to you, coming to an allopathic doctor for, uh, uh, for, for treatment? No, so what are the options you're considering? Like, I'm talking about Ayurveda, how homeopathy? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, my answer may seem uh, a little extreme to some people, but homeopathy has been de-recognized in most of the European countries. Uh, a lot of scientific study has been done in uh, in America, UK, etc., where uh, they have uh, demonstrated that homeopathic medications do not even have one molecule of the active ingredient, which they uh, say that they have. And um, it's been officially branded as quackery in uh, US and UK. And if you sell homeopathic medicines in US or UK or most of Europe, you'll find yourself under behind bars. Okay. Ayurveda, Ayurved on the other hand, is, um, is a mixed bag. So it's good for certain things, not good. And there are some medicines which are very toxic, um, which have high amounts of metals. So I keep myself away from all these uh, so-called magical cures. Yeah, but um, I mean, uh, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm very uh, sure about this. And I mean, this is a sign. I mean, my opinion is a scientific opinion. And in scientific opinion, homeopathy has been disproved beyond doubt because it's like uh, uh, it's not even it's not even it acts sometimes it ne can never act because the I mean it can cause in fact alcohol poisoning and stuff like that you know because certain they certain medicines have alcohol and uh, yeah but it's 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 proven to be uh, completely uh, bunkum I mean. I, I'm not going to mince my words, but uh, you will be in jail if you pres even if you prescribe a bottle of homeopathy in uh, US or UK. Right, doctor. Uh, thank you very much for being as candid as you have been. Um, as you are aware, once again, I'll mention to you that sessions like these are advisory in nature. It's always best to go for a clinical examination uh, and meet your doctor for getting the advice, as Doctor himself said, that it's impossible to uh, to to crunch uh, eleven years of uh, hard knowledge that he has gained uh, in in a uh, one minute response. So please do that. Uh, you know, doctors like uh, Doctor Koshal Chattopati are also available uh, for a teleconsult. So you could also also do that. But once again, as I said, teleconsult will obviously mean some physical examination, but uh, the, the point is that uh, this was a, 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 a session that we wanted to do on uh, uh, preventive cardiology and medication management. And um, increasingly, we find that, you know, uh, these basic issues also need to be addressed apart from uh, uh, the, the larger issues that we keep doing in our health webinar sessions. Uh, thank you very much, do Dr. Koshal Chattapati, for uh, for this session, um, what we will do is we will take uh, offline. I'll take your coordinates, which can be shared with our uh, uh, with, with our readers. And as always, the edited video will be up on the Seniors Today website on Monday evening, and along with uh, the uh, uh, takeaways, which, as you know, are written by a, a qualified medical practitioner. We will be back once again. Uh, in our usual time of 5 p.m. on Saturday evening next week for another session of health webinar. And uh, those of you who want to pre-register, you can look up the uh, chat. What I'm going to do, doctor, is we, we run a magazine, which is a monthly magazine, and um, which is available free of cost and which has been there for the last four and a half years. The new issue has just been out on the 15th. 
and uh, uh, no get, no 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 marks for guessing what the topic could be. So I'm going to I request our producer to uh, play the video. This is a very interesting uh, issue, I must say, and and a very. issue of seniors today as always you know our evergreen club app has a host of activities through the week and uh, the next season the season 14 of the seniors have talent is starting from uh, Wednesday the 21st so you must uh, uh, tune in for that once again thank you very much Dr. Koshal Chattapati for accepting our inf information uh, in invitation rather and uh, speaking as candidly as uh, one can and for uh, uh, for educating our uh, uh, readers about uh, the ways in which one can prevent uh, heart and cardiac issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <clears throat>